I want to talk about anxiety. One of those things that happens in a lot of people's lives. I want to start off with definition of anxiety. And this is not something that's coming out of God's word. But I want to define anxiety in a sense so that we kind of know, okay, this is what we're talking about. So I'd like to start off with a definition of anxiety. And I, I can't throw out enough caveats before I talk about stuff like this. I know that there's stuff in the human mind going on and I am never going to be able to thoroughly and completely explain everything. But I want to spend a little time just talking about what we know about anxiety and you know how it affects people just so we kind of get established on it. Anxiety, well, I looked at different definitions and I tried to boil it down and this is what I came up with. An inner mental and emotional or and or emotional turmoil that's experienced as nervous behavior, unfocused thinking, emotional overreaction. And anxiety is different from fear. Anxiety is different from fear because fear is really an appropriate response to a threat. That's fear. You're wired to be afraid of tigers coming out of the jungle and attacking you. It's just normal. And fear is an appropriate response to a real threat. Whereas anxiety, anxiety is a reaction more to a perceived threat. So it's all taking place in the theater of the mind, if you will. Um, a perceived threat or perhaps an expectation of a possible future threat. So anxiety is characterized by a future-oriented mood or state of mind where the anxious party feels unprepared uh, or inadequate, if you will, unable to cope with what may lay ahead. So you could also say that it's a sense of dread or apprehension. There are different types of anxiety out there. And again, this is just me, I've, I've done a little bit of research, I'm not a psychologist, but there are some different types of anxiety that touch our lives in different ways. One is existential anxiety, which of course that sounds very highfalutin with a word like existential, but it's a mental conflict that takes place or can take place in the mind concerning whether life has any meaning or purpose. You know, am I just a, you know, Forrest Gump's feather floating on the wind or what? And it's a struggle with the idea, when you get right down to it, that you may simply at some point cease to exist. It's kind of a very nihilistic way of approaching reality, but some people struggle with that more than others. There's another type of anxiety that's uh, called performance anxiety. And I think this is one that probably all of us can say, yeah, I've, I've, I've gone through that. Performance anxiety, which are thoughts about the results of your actions. Which, that makes sense. I mean, you should think about what you're doing. That's, that's, you know, there are parts of this where, yeah, that's, that all makes sense. But thoughts about what you're doing, what your actions may bring about. Um, will they result in failure, disapproval from others? That's a big one that causes a lot of anxiety. Or losing a sense of personal worth. You know, that am I a, am I a worthwhile person? And again, that kind of plays back to the whole idea of, whether people approve of you or disapprove of you. you know, I guess in common terms, do people like me or not? People worry about that an awful lot. And, right, you know, and we'll explain a little bit more about that in the next point. As far as performance anxiety, look, some of it is necessary to optimize your performance in certain situations. If you're a, if you're a, a surgeon, you know, or if you have a surgeon who's operating on you, you want him to be on his game, and you want him to be a little bit worried about his reputation. Uh, you know, someone who's flying a jet airliner, and you're a passenger. I was a big Beatles fan when I was young, and I remember John Lennon. Does anyone remember John Lennon? Anyway, I, a lot of things he said were really dumb, but he said he had a lot of experiences, and he said, oh, I've always had butterflies in my stomach before I go up and sing and perform. Of course, here's a guy who's, you know, internationally famous, but he always felt kind of nervous going up. So he had a little bit of performance anxiety, and it kept him on his game, and that's what he said about it. He said, if you don't have any anxiety or a little bit of, you know, a few butterflies in your stomach, you'll probably mess up because you're too relaxed. So performance anxiety, although it's necessary, can also become uncontrollable, where you worry, 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 worry about, well, how's this all going to work out in the future? What may happen? What might happen? Another kind of anxiety is social anxiety. 
where people worry about their relationship with others. Now, human beings, and we're all human beings here, human beings are a social creature. Okay? You're a social creature. Evolutionists would agree with you on that. We would agree. We'd all agree. Human beings are social creatures. Now, someone who does not believe in God as our creator would just say, well, that's part of our survival, pro you know, what's built into us to help us survive. You know, we, we don't have any sharp claws or long teeth, so we need to band together so we can hunt animals and, and all that kind of stuff. Whereas we would say, well, yeah, we know that we are communal, if you will, because that's the way God created us. Adam, Eve were created in a relationship. Man and God, or human to human, Adam and Eve. Even from the very beginning, relationships were a big deal. And they can cause a lot of anxiety because we think about them an awful lot. We think about them a lot because we have a built-in need for social acceptance. So this plays back to what I said earlier, where there's a lot of anxiety is caused by anticipation or expectation of disapproval um, or negative judgment about who and what we are, our sense of worth and so forth. I realize I'm just skimming across the top here. I'm not doing a deep dive on, on um, the psychological traits of anxiety. Another one is called trait anxiety. It's a, what I would call a proclivity. Like, you know, you're kind of wired that way if you want to think about it in those terms. A trait anxiety is a proclivity that can be passed along genetically, uh, such as, um, here's an example, a particularly active or sensitive amygdala lobe in your brain where you just are really sensitive to certain things, okay? So you could be wired with a proclivity for anxiety. That would kind of be an expectation. Oh, well, you know, things always go wrong. You know, some people are just a um, glass half empty type of person. That's me, actually. <laughs> I, am a, I have to admit I'm a glass half, and my wife's smiling, yes. I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. And it's one of those things that it's not the best, but I, at this point in 55 years, I, eh, I'm kind of wired that way. I have to deal with it, though. It doesn't mean I can just blow it off and say, yeah, that's how I am. An expectation that, well, things just always go wrong would be an example of how that would play out, okay? Now, there's a proclivity there, but they're still triggered by your thoughts and what you allow yourself to think about, right? Makes sense. And sometimes these thought patterns are unconscious. Uh, sometimes they're very deeply rooted in your past and how you were raised and so forth. Another kind of anxiety is choice or decision. Uh, this is one that I feel like it has taken off in all kinds of new directions, at least in my lifetime. Definitely the 21st century culture presents so many options. I don't know, I don't know what it was like 100 years ago, but I know that uh, when I was young, we didn't have anywhere near as many brands of toothpaste as we do now. Now, I know that's kind of a trivial example, but... In our lives and in our experience, we have so many choices nowadays that we have to make these decisions all the time. So anxiety can be caused by having perhaps too many decisions, too many things to decide, too many things to think about. And with so many options, have a heightened sense of uncertainty about outcomes. Well, what's going to happen? What if I choose this kind of mutual fund as opposed to that kind of mutual fund? How will this affect my future? Will this be damaging? Worry, 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 worry. One last one I've got here is pathological. That's not really something that I, I'm going to spend any time on, but that would be anxiety that is a symptom of some form of mental disorder, for example. Like a person who is uh, diagnosed schizophrenic, for example. They might have a, a anxiety that comes from mental disorder. But as I mentioned, that's really not my, my thing. That's not what I'm good at. That's not what I'm here for. What I'm here for is to teach about God's word. And that's what we're gathered here for as well. So I've given you, you know, what Wikipedia and a couple of other websites that I was able to research can tell us about anxiety. And it's only good for just kind of laying the groundwork and thinking, okay, yeah, that's what we're talking about with anxiety. But does God's word have anything helpful or meaningful 
to say about anxiety? Or are we just left on our own to deal with these things? Now, I would say that all people at all times have had anxieties. All people at all times have had anxieties. And, and, and that there's a, there's a very good possibility, but I really don't know, that our present generation and our present time has a greater or more complex array of anxieties. We've got more things to worry about, more options to worry about, but does it mean we worry more? I am not sure. It's a possibility, but I am not convinced. So I think that we tend to think of ourselves as perhaps we are the age of anxiety. We've got so many more worries now in the year 2000, and it's almost 2017, than people did in the year 17. But I don't know. I think people have always had anxiety, things to be worried about. What I would be willing to say is that our generations definitely suffer anxiety about different things than people might have a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. People might have worried more about how to get their next meal a thousand, two thousand years ago. Whereas today, we might be more likely to be anxious about how we're going to stay employable in a highly mobile and rapidly changing technological environment, right? But when you boil them down, they kind of end up in the same place. How am I going to feed my family, right? So anxiety, I think, is something we can say, mm, it's been around, it's always been around. People have always had plenty of options uh, for anxiety to worry about stuff. What makes people anxious today then is different. And it's different today than it was from when I was young. People worry about different things nowadays than when I was a teenager, for example. Now, some people might say, well, okay, it's all different now, so therefore you don't have anything to say. You know, in the year 2017, what was going on in 1969 or 1973 and what you worried about back then is irrelevant. I disagree. And I think the same argument can be used about God's word to say, well, that's olden times. And I've, I've talked with my kids enough to have heard that phrase, you know, mostly about me. They've never, never been bold enough to say that about the scriptures, but they've said that about me. Well, you know, basically saying, well, what do you really know about what's going on today? Right? I've heard that. Well, that was olden times, Dad. You don't know the way it is now. And I think that it's very easy for people to use that same sort of argument to poo-poo the Bible and say, well, the Bible has nothing to really offer me in this complex modern world. Now, I, as, uh, as, as the pastor and the one who's given this responsibility, I suppose I could give you all kinds of coaching techniques about how to deal with modern anxieties. I'd probably not do a very great job at it. It's really not my strength. It's not my thing. It's not what I'm here for. It's not my purpose. But if you're willing, and if you've walked with me through that line of reasoning, and you're willing to agree with me that anxiety is as old as people, as old as dirt, then it's reasonable to believe that God's word has something to offer all people at all times for something that all people at all times have suffered and had to deal with. So my purpose is to pass along, if you will, and I hope that's what we do here, to pass along what our father and our elder brother, Jesus Christ, have to say about anxiety. Now, they may not offer you any suggestions or coping techniques for dealing with the angst of not having anybody like your latest Facebook post. But there are principles that are applicable in all cases for all people at all times. And it reaches a much more fundamental level of who and what we are and how we deal with life. So why is anxiety a problem? Why do we even bother? 
Isn't it all just taking place in the mind? It doesn't really affect anything, does it? No one's dying. Why is anxiety a problem? Well, let's set aside the issues related to mental health and stuff like that, um, emotional well-being, and limit the answer to spiritual matters, to spiritual matters, because that's our primary concern here. There are things to be said about those other areas, but that's not what we are here for here today. So we'll limit it to spiritual matters. Anxiety. Anxiety is very real, and it is a problem on many, many levels. But when we talk about the spiritual level, if you want, when we talk about the spiritual issues, it, is a, it can be, and it is, a spiritual problem that in the sense that it has a negative effect on your spirit life. Anxiety is a problem because in many ways, it is the great enemy of faith. One of the great enemies of faith. Perhaps even a mental state that if left unchecked, can kill or suppress that life-giving faith that God wants us to develop. So what I want to present is not offered as any kind of solution for people with, like, for example, pathological anxiety or, uh, you know, people who are suffering from things like that. Such stuff is left, you know, better left to people who are psychiatric professionals. So I say that because I've heard messages before that try and touch on, you know, techniques and scientific studies and stuff like that. And, it's sketchy territory when your pastor starts doing that. So I just want to let you know that that's not where I'm going and that's not where I'm headed. And don't take any of this. If you have anxieties, all right, don't take this as some kind of a diagnosis from a psychiatrist. It's not. It's just a pastor talking to you about God's word. And I don't want to imply that anyone who, for example, might have a biochemical or genetic proclivity for anxiety cannot develop strong faith. And I say that because I have met people like that. And they can get very upset. And I don't want that to happen to anybody. If you're a very anxious person, it might be the way you're, you're born. Some of you might have a proclivity for anxiety. You might just be a very anxious person. And all I can say to you from God's word is that that is a cross or a trial that you must bear in life like other things that people suffer from. One that comes to mind is alcoholism or drug addiction or something like that. You could be a person with a proclivity for that, but you have to deal with it, as God says. Right? We all have our proclivities, and some of them are a cross or a trial that we must bear in life. Now, others may have absolutely no proclivity, or you know they're not really open or... They're not naturally anxious, but they more than, more than willingly allow anxiety and anxious thoughts to take over their, their mind and their thoughts through their own choices about what they want to dwell on. But in either case, and this is, I think this is very important when we talk about you know, the whole argument of, well, I was born that way. The plan that God has, in either case, the person who wants to develop the mind of Christ must address it. And in this case, must address their anxious thoughts. And God's prescribed plan of action is the same for everybody. Granted, it's going to work out differently in everyone's lives, but it's the same plan. Okay, how can we fight anxiety? I asked the question about, does God's word have anything to offer us? Well, I think it has quite a bit. And we'll get there soon. Anxiety. Anxiety says... Everything is up to me. It's all up to me. I have to make it all happen. It's all up to me. If I can pull this off, if I can be Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, of, of, you know, I can thread the needle and I can, yeah, if I'm just good enough, I can make it happen. That is the way anxiety looks at life. It's all up to me. It's all up to me. It all depends on me. And if you remember the definition that we had of anxiety and, and so forth, the anxious mind is concerned that they're just not going to 
live up to the task. That they're not good enough. That, that somehow, well, I always, I always fail. Things always go wrong. They always, they always somehow go awry. And they're worried, anxious, that they'll let people down. Their mate, their children, themselves, they'll let God down, and so forth. Just, it's a way of thinking that somehow they will be weighed in the balances and found wanting, just not good enough. To that, to that, Scripture says, no. <laughs> scripture says, no, don't be so focused on yourself. And I could spend hours going through all the Scriptures where God takes a person, like Job, for example, and says, Job, you're really, you're not the center of the universe. You're just Job. You're just Job. Where were you when I, you know, when I created the planet and when I built the atmosphere around the planet, when I put the stars out? You, nah, you had nothing to do with that. You had nothing to do with that. Don't be so focused on yourself, okay. Don't be so sure, and to, to the question about anxiety, don't be so sure that success or failure is all in your hands. That it's all up to you. Turn to 1 Peter 5, if you would, and verses 5 through 7. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Now here's the part I wanted to get started focusing on. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And cast all your anxiety, now I'm reading from the NIV, and it uses the word anxiety. Cast all your anxiety, all your worries, and, and, and all the things, that's the fretting in your mind, cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. You know, we, we were watching that video, and a, one thing I would add to that is that forgiveness is about casting it off to, to God. I mean, it, the situation was beyond Andy Deemer's ability to deal with uh, in any way. He, he was not in a position to punish the man or do anything, but his forgiveness really was, I think, giving it over to God. I'm going to give this to you because it's out of my league. It's beyond my pay grade, God. Now, take that same concept, I think we can and should apply it to anxiety. It says in that scripture that God gives his favor. And if you're reading the King James, it probably says grace. Favor. God is on your side. He gives you favor. He's working for you. Not as your employee, you know what I mean. He's on your side. He wants you to succeed and do well. Of course, he has goals for you that sometimes you don't really know. We'll get around to that a little bit more. But God gives his favor, his approval, his help to who? He gives it to the humble. Gives it to the humble. What's the connection? Well, I'll try and draw, I'll connect some dots here. The humble person, I believe, is willing to acknowledge their need for assistance. I need help. I need help. Rather than to have the mindset, well, it's all up to me. And not even in the sense, it's all up to me, like I'm really confident that I can do it, but someone might feel in a very anxious way, it's all up to me. And I, I don't know if I'm up to this. But a humble person is willing to acknowledge their need for assistance. And a humble person is humble enough to ask. That, of course, gets into the whole other realm of prayer, supplication, asking, just asking. I mean, as a parent, you know, if you've raised kids, there are times when you just want them to ask. Just ask, please. Ask me for help. But they won't. We're like that, too. It causes incredible amounts of anxiety. But a per humble person, to such a person, God provides answers, assistance, and a whole lot more. He says he will. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Turn to Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 through 3. You might be scratching your head when you 
when you hear these, to wonder, how is this connecting? Work with me. That's all I can ask. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1 through 3. Again, I'm reading the NIV, and it says, Ship your grain across the sea, and after many days you may receive a return. Uh, King James, I believe, says, Cast your bread upon the waters. Same idea. Put it out there. Ship your grain across the sea. From After many days you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures. You know, put it here, do this, go there. Yep, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where it falls, there will it lie. So what does this have to do with anxiety? There are a lot of things we can worry about. There are a lot of things we can worry about. This is talking about how you deal with what might happen, right? You just don't know what's going to happen. So invest some time here, invest some time there, invest some time here and there, because you really don't know which cylinders are going to be firing. You have, and also, you have very little control over things. We tend to think of ourselves as having a tremendous degree of control over our lives, and we make the choices, and we have this freedom of will, and we live in a democracy, and we can make the choices, and if we just make the right choices, everything's going to work out. That's not reality. I think those of us who have been on the planet a little longer realize, I don't really have a whole lot of control over a whole lot. And a lot of stuff just happens. And I am just not able to get in front of the parade or make any difference on what direction the parade is going to take. Then what good is it for us to shake our hand at the clouds and say, why didn't you rain today? Or to get mad at the tree because it fell this way instead of that way, and that way was on your garage, and this way was off in the woods. You didn't have any control over that tree. You laugh, does that happen to you? <laughs> I hope it doesn't hurt. But the idea is, you just don't know. Now let's read verse 4. It says, Whoever watches the wind will not plant, and whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Stuff happens, okay? Stuff happens. And what the, what the scriptures are telling us here is, you can't spend all your time looking at the wind and wondering, well, what, where's it going to blow? What's going to happen? Where are the clouds going to go? What's happening? Because you don't have a whole lot of control over them. You have very little control. Stuff happens, but what you must not do is spend all day worrying about the wind and the clouds, which here are things that you have no control over. It could be anything, not wind, not clouds, but for the sake of God's word, presenting something in a way that all people at all times can understand, don't spend all your time worrying about these elements that are out of your control to do anything about, such that you never go out and actively do the things you need to do in life, to plant the field, to reap the field. Okay? You just have to go forth and do. And we, uh, we have phrases in our society that we use, which are actually very good. You know, one day at a time comes to mind. It's very appropriate and very, actually very wise, and Scripture says some of the same stuff. One foot in front of the other, you just have to keep plodding forward and stuff like that. Okay, we, we, people know that. And that's kind of understandable. Now let's read verses 5 and 6. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how a body is formed in its mother's womb, and um, other translations bring that out really nicely where they talk about the spiritual development and the spirit of man in, a, in, a, in the mother's womb. You don't know all this stuff that's going on, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And it goes on and, say, and says, Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether they will both do really well. So you can't let worry about things beyond your control stop you from doing anything. I think at face value, sometimes you, you know, might have read this in Ecclesiastes and thought, well, what is that talking about? Well, I think it's just talking about stuff happens and stuff happens that you can't control, but you can't let it get to the point where you are just unable to deal with life and go on living. 
which happens. I mean, some people don't relate to that, but some people probably do. And the message we're getting there, I believe, is don't worry, just keep sowing. Don't worry, just sow, just sow the seeds. We must not let ourselves start thinking that life is merely a series of random and unpredictable events. And here, it's uh, referencing the work of God. You don't understand the work of God, the maker of all things, the creator of all things. And God tells us through his word in so many places, I don't even think I need to turn to a scripture, that there is control and order in the universe that he has created. But, as we read here, and this is, this is hard, this actually takes humility, a lot of it, most of it perhaps, is way over your head. And we like to think in the church that, well, we've, you know, we know all this stuff. We know God's plan. We know everything. And, but we really, we know what we need to know. But there's a lot of stuff going on in this world and this universe and this creation and all the people that run around on the planet and stuff that happens, like we saw in that video, we have no idea what's really being worked on. We don't know. And this applies to understanding the ins and outs of the material world, you know, the makings of the universe and so forth and the functions of the spiritual, what's going on with God's spiritual work and God's spiritual creation, what lays behind the curtain, if you will. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Paul is trying to explain big, big spiritual concepts here. And then in verse 12, he makes this sort of admission, which I think is very realistic and humble, he says, for now we see only a reflection. We only see a re as if we're watching a reflection in a mirror. But then, at some point, we will see face to face. We will see God. Now I know in part. I only know a part. I know what I need to know, I guess. I know part of what's going on. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now you can take this scripture on a very personal level and talk about, you know, your your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, but it also, I believe, applies to a way of looking at the world and God's work in the world. We see what we see. We know what we know. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, perhaps humble enough, we realize it's really not that much. And there's a lot of stuff going on that, wow, I don't know. So if, if humility is part of the answer, if having this more humble approach to what we know or what we are, you know, what's even possible for us to control. If humility is part of the answer, then where might pride fit in? Where might pride fit in? Well, sometimes pride won't allow us to seek God's help. Right? And that gets back to what we looked at earlier, okay? A humble person has to acknowledge that they can't handle it all on their own and that they need help. So sometimes pride might not allow us to seek God's help with a, a mind uh, that perhaps says something like, well, I should be able to figure this all out. I say that because uh, I, I have that kind of thinking a lot. I need to get this all figured out. I should be able to work this out. I should be able to come up with a logical, rational, reasonable answer for this. And answer anyone who asks me the question and have it right there. And lay it all out. So it'll just be so breathtakingly obvious that they will, I don't know, that the scales will fall off their eyes and the lotus petals will fall from heaven and it'll all just work out. Now that approach, unfortunately, can leave a person stuck in what I'm going to call a feedback loop, okay? I should be able to figure this out, but there's stuff going on that I cannot explain or cannot control, but I can't move forward until I figure this out. I should be able to figure this out but there's stuff that I can't explain, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can get stuck in this negative feedback loop. And I think that anxiety could cause a person to be unable to move forward and to move ahead with the life that God wants them to practice and pursue because they don't have enough confidence in the potential outcome. Where's this all going to go? I need to know. I need to have it all mapped out. I need to have a plan. And they are anxious to get back to what we said in the definition portion about what might happen. Well, what might happen? But humility 
can allow us to move forward with greater confidence. We have to start, though, with accepting that there is a lot of stuff going on out there that is way over our heads. That God is at work, that God is doing things that we don't know. And that takes some humility. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 6. This is uh, just a little verse that uh, I remember because it's always struck me. It's in the middle of a psalm where David's talking about how God just has this ability to reach him wherever he is on some sort of spiritual CB radio and track him down and know what he's doing and search his, his spirit. And he's thinking about it and pondering about what, what God's doing. And then in verse 6 he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me and too lofty for me to attain. I just, I can't figure it all out and I can't give you an explanation for everything that's going on. I know it's wonderful what God's doing, but it's too, it's too lofty for me. It's too wonderful and wise for me to get. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 33. This is kind of Paul at the end of a long section of very rational thinking where he's going through scriptures and explaining things to people and using analogies. And then it's almost like he bursts out in song at the end of it, verse 33, and he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And if you think about the video that we watched, on many levels, that's the only way you can really deal with what you saw. Unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And it's very easy for us, for others, to say, if I can't explain it and I can't lay it all out for you and explain why it's all happening the way it's happening, then I don't have any confidence. And I don't have confidence that God is at work. So where do we stand? Okay. Where do we stand? Stuff happens that you can't control. God is in control. But then you also can't possibly understand everything that he's up to. So I think that there's a logical question there, which is, how does that move the ball forward for me? How does that give me any greater confidence in the future and, you know, help calm my anxious mind? I feel, if that's all there is, that I'm still in the dark and it can all come across as kind of random. It's just happening. If I can't explain it. The answer, your confidence in the future, or your faith, if you will, is not because you have been given a better idea of what the future holds. That's not where your faith and confidence really come from. Because as much as we like to think we know, and I've searched the scriptures and I've studied prophecy, we really don't know. And there's not a lot that we can really pin down and say, I know exactly what's going to happen when, where, how. We don't know. Our faith and our confidence comes from a confidence in the nature and the character of the one who is in control. Thus the very scriptural phrase, your faith and confidence is in God, in his character and his nature. The care, the concern, the love that God has for you, which you learn over a lifetime, you learn some from his scriptures, some from answered prayer, some from trials and suffering that you go through, but you learn about the character and nature of God, and that is where your faith and your confidence in the future comes from. Not that you've been given some kind of insight or secret knowledge or anything like that. And what does God want us to do with this? What does God want us to do? Well, I think as we read earlier, his word to us is, don't worry, just sow, plant seeds, harvest your crop, build, live, you know, have a family, do all the things that I've put there for you to do. As the scriptures say, God has created good works that you move forward in them and you do them. So keep sowing, keep doing, keep living. And I believe God's word says to us, don't worry over the results. I mean, Andy Deemer, he forgave that guy. He couldn't worry about what's going to happen to that guy in prison. Is he going to learn his lesson? You know, is justice going to be served? He, he had to just give it over, right? 
Don't worry about the results. Just so. Just do that. Uh, you could think of what Paul said, for example, um, in regard to all the work he did in establishing the work in the church, the congregation there in Corinth. He said, I, Paul, planted. Paulos watered. But God provided the growth. So the results were of God. Paul planted. He had to you know, go forth and do the sowing, do the planting, do the work, do the things that God wanted him to do. Apollos did likewise, but God provided the growth. The outcome came from God. As I mentioned earlier, we simply move forward, one foot in front of the next, if you will, or one day at a time. Now that can still come across, I think, sometimes as a little bit on the random side. Oh, just scatter your seeds abroad, wherever, whenever, however. Whatever will be, will be. Que sera, sera. And it doesn't really sound like much of an action plan, as much as maybe just, you know, resigning yourself to meaningless or at least unimportance to your actions. Well, nothing I do is particularly important. God's going to do it all anyway. Well, you can control something. You might think, wow, I thought this was going to be all about how I can't control anything. You do have things, something very important that you can control. You can control the type of seeds that you sow. That you can do. God's given you that. Turn with me to Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Or you might have a translation that says, diligently seek him. There's a lot packed into that verse. A person must have faith. They must believe that God created all things, that he exists, that he is who he says he is, that there's control in the universe, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. We can control the type of seeds we sow. Now, I could go into, well, you might say, well, what seeds are you talking about? Well, we talk about that almost every week. The seeds that you need to sow, what you need to go out and do. But we can't control the results. You can offer forgiveness to some person. This murderer guy that we saw in the video there. You can do what's right, but you can't control the results. Andy Deemer had no control over how that guy responded. It was totally beyond him. All he could do was sow the seed or do the work that God has put forward for him to do. But he could not control the results. Now take that and you can apply it, I think, in hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of different ways. We can control that. So let's make sure that every day we sow the good seeds that God wants us to sow. God does not tell us in advance which seeds are going to grow and which seeds aren't. If you, is anyone a gardener? Does anyone do gardening? Well, when you plant your garden and you plant a row, I remember when I first planted a garden, I got this seed pack and I opened it up and, oh man, there must be a hundred seeds in there. Wow, this is cool. I'm going to have a hundred beets or whatever, you know? So I take out a seed, oh, a little seed, and I put it in the little hole and then I'd go, oh yeah, and I'd cover it over with soil, right? And then you take the next seed and you put it in there. And I thought, a hundred seeds, man, this is going to do like, this is going to do a hundred square yards of, of, of garden, or maybe less, ten square yards of garden. Thinking, and I'm going to get a hundred beets out of this pack of seeds. So you're laughing, because you know exactly where I'm going. No, when you plant a garden, what do you do? Do you put more than one seed in each of these little holes? Because you don't know which of those seeds is going to burst forth and become a beet. The planting of the seeds, and I realize it's just an analogy and it does break down at certain points. They're not all good seeds. But you put the seeds in the ground. If you never put them in the ground, they would never grow. You can't control which ones are going to germinate and which ones won't. You just know in advance, like we read in Ecclesiastes. But you have to plant the seeds. And God does not allow us to know in advance. You know, he might say, nope, that's not a good seed. <coughs> and I'd go and get another one. I don't know in advance which is going to be a good seed. Or let, let's, let's not say that. I don't know in advance which one's going to take off. All right? Let's say they're all good seeds. 
They're all beet seeds, all right? But I don't know which one's going to germinate and which one's not. Okay, I don't know the future. That's what I'm, analogies break down. I don't want to get too lost in it. But if we continue to do the things that are pleasing to God, as we read in Ecclesi oh, sorry, Hebrews 11, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But if we continue to do those things that are pleasing to God and continue on in doing what we know every day, putting these good seeds in the ground, he will provide growth where growth is needed. Not everywhere we want it to be, but where it's needed. He will take care of you. You don't need to be anxious about the future because you never will know the future. You never will. So just stop right now because you won't know. But faith allows you to have confidence in the future because you know that God is in control, that he's watching over you, and his desire is wonderful for you. And as we read there, it says he rewards those who diligently seek him. Those who keep plowing the field, sowing the seeds, whatever. It's kind of focused on farmers. And we might have different analogies for our day and time. But he will take care of you and nurture you as you grow into the fullness of Christ. And he will take care of us, his church. So, you do your research you know, gardener, this is your gardening manual. You do your research, all right? Find out what is pleasing to God and sow diligently and keep planting the good seeds and have confidence, have confidence in God to determine the outcome.